question is, is there an ideal time to consume creatine post or pre-training? Great question. There's actually been studies to look at whether pre or post matters. And most studies show that as long as you have enough creatine per day, uh, that it really doesn't, the timing doesn't play a role. Um, with that said, we still recommend after exercise because when we are working with athletes, we want to optimize recovery. We want to promote hydration, we want to increase uh, availability of protein and amino acids for protein synthesis. I want to maximize glycogen synthesis. And we know that creatine uptake is dependent on glucose or carbohydrate. And that combining protein intake with that seems to allow for greater uptake. So we still recommend to have, once you've loaded, have your creatine in a post-workout carbohydrate protein supplement to optimize the recovery process. Okay. So I know many of the studies at the start were done with creatine um, uh, dissolved in coffee. The question is, does consuming creatine in coffee lessen or negate the effect? Good question. Uh, we have a couple papers. One is on creatine myths, phase one. Another phase is coming out, and we address a lot of these issues. So go to creatine myths, Crider, you'll be able to find them. Um, but a couple studies initially... Uh, we're done to show that if you added, you combine creatine with caffeine, you lessen the ergogenic difference between caffeine or creatine. Uh, and so that kind of started this thought that, well, maybe co-ingestion of creatine is not good with caffeine. However, most of the initial studies done by uh, Roger Harris and Paul Greenhoff and Eric Holtman mixed creatine in hot tea, caffeinated tea. And they showed the initial ergogenic benefit. Uh, I've never uh, really thought too much of the data on caffeine. And the reason is because most athletes will have caffeine for lots of other ergogenic reasons. That's not going to affect your uptake. If you're taking creatine enough uh, in your daily, uh, a small difference won't have an effect. There are different energy systems. There are different roles in utilization. If anything, because of neural uh, impact, you might see a little bit less ergogenic benefit because you're getting benefit from caffeine too, uh, but that won't uh, diminish the amount of creatine taken up into the muscle. It still is loaded effectively. So I've not bought that that whole theory, and we actually list it as a myth. Mm -hmm. And then coffee obviously normally is warm, although in, in the United States, iced coffee is very popular as well. The solvability. Uh, improves when the, the liquid is warm. Is there any uh, thing known about the stability of creatine uh, dissolved in warm versus uh, cold drinks? That was one of the reasons in uh, England they suggested to be able to put it in a warm fluid so that it mixes better than rather than having a little bit of sediment at the bottom. As long as you're consuming all the creatine in the drink, it's not going to make a difference. And so you can mix it, you can put it in different juices and let it suspend better, or, you know, you can dry scoop it and slam down water or, or a sports drink afterward. As long as you're getting the creatine in your body, it's not going to affect uh, whether it's warm or hot, the creatine uptake. The key is to get all the creatine into the body. And if you put it in a mix and it said, don't let it sit and sort of make sure you swirl it around and get it all in you. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Uh, is there research supporting the use of creatine for increasing muscle mass in postmenopausal women? Yes, that's one of the really uh, great areas for research that have been done, uh, but um, is being explored to a greater degree. So uh, there's evidence that after uh, me uh, menopause, you know, you have a, a hormonal change, you increase body fat, you lose muscle mass. So with resistance training, um, you also have a tendency to lose bone mass. With resistance training and creatine, you're able to have a better training adaptation, better maintenance and uh, muscle mass. And there's some data out of uh, Darren Kando's lab up in Canada showing for up to two years some bone density improvement and actually strengthening of bones in postmenopausal women. So we think this is one of the more promising aspects of creatine that if you, it's probably more important in, um, in as you're aging to take creatine than the athlete that we used to think that would be the benefit. Because that here's an example where postmenopausal women can benefit from strength, muscle, 
resistance training and bone strengthening. Okay. Okay. Great. So different angle can creatine supplementation improve hydration status for sport. Yes. So uh, back in the day, we used to think or there was reports that creatine causes dehydration. This is another one mentioned in our myths. Actually, creatine causes fluid retention. And when you combine creatine monohydrate with glycerol, for example, you have a really strong hyperhydration formula uh, that's better than glycerol alone. But generally what happens, you actually will get a little bit of fluid because the, um, the creatine will take a little bit of water in the cell that actually helps volumize and stretch the cell, which is one of the reasons we think there may be some uh, protein synthesis effects and other benefits of the cell hydration. And so you get that benefit, but if you really are dehydrating, take it with glycerol, you can get a better effect than glycerol alone. Okay. So you mentioned the loading uh, phase to maximize creatine storage. Uh, so the question here is, is creatine loading a must? Or can you start with, for example, five gram a day and get the same storage over time? You can eventually get there if you take, uh, say, five grams, three to five grams a day for a month. Okay. The studies that showed that were about 80% of the creatine storage compared to loading and then maintaining after a week. The question is, how long do you want to wait to get ergogenic benefit? And so we still have athletes load. If we're trying to build muscle and improve their performance, we want the creatine levels to get in the muscle quickly so you get a quick ergogenic benefit. Why wait a whole three, four, five, six weeks before you get the levels to the point where you actually can get some ergogenic benefit of having the extra creatine? On the other hand, if you're taking it for just health benefits, you really don't need to load. You just need to take three, five grams of your body weight per day to get the health benefits. And over time, you're going to saturate your, your muscle. There's no real worry about performance then you probably can do a low level creatine over time and still get there. Yeah. Yeah. And I know the, the case based example that um, in, in the Netherlands, uh, speed skating is world famous. Uh, so we have a lot of good speed skaters and some of them were just uh, having issues with their coordination. If they were doing that acute loading phase. And then if they did it more gradually then on the ice with those thin irons that they have on their skates, they, they, oh. they, those thin blades, they were they they felt that they were just adapting better to 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 the creatine loading if it was a gradual uh, yeah so situation. there's a couple of great points there one is if it does make you gain a little weight uh in some events you have to kind of consider is the power better than the weight gain okay usually you're going to gain one to two three four kilos over time in training you always want to load during training. You don't want to load necessarily right before competition because you want to get your muscles saturated to get the advantage during training. And then you only need low dose up to train. You don't need to uh, load again before a competition. So for athletes, we try to do the loading actually in the preseason or off season so that we're just maintaining uh, elevated stores as they're competing. And that allows for those subtle changes on biomechanics and those things to be able to be translated with less uh, impact on performance. Yeah. Okay. So is it, uh, is there research on creating use and sleep disturbance? Yes. Uh, one of the really interesting thing is that if you are sleep deprived, uh, and provide creatine loaded before sleep deprivation, you tend to have better cognition after the creatine loading. So we're looking at things like, uh, you know, in, um, in the military, you fly, you know, uh, 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 pilots will fly overnight or 36 hours and then have to perform and they're sleep deprived. And so this seems to create the health with brain creatine content and that helps you handle sleep deprivation. I've not seen any studies showing that there's any sleep disturbances due to creatine. Uh, and again, creatine has been extensively studied for side effects. We did one study for 21 months in athletes and compared creatine users versus non-users, 10 grams a day of creatine versus just normal uh, carbohydrate protein type of supplements. And we actually showed a lower instance of a lot of those type of, uh, of problems associated with heavy training. We think that creatine helps you tolerate heavier loads. So you have less sympathetic nervous system disruption and less sleep disturbances with heavy training. Okay. 
Okay. So maybe um, a point of order for anyone on the call. I see that questions are still loading up, which is obviously uh, great. But at the same time, within the time that we have, we're not able to, to, to deal with them all. So please use the function to upvote questions so that I can at least uh, get the most popular ones out. Um, are there any adverse effects in excess creatine consumption? No. Um, so the only side effects reported in all the literature is weight gain, which is a desired effect for most people who are involved with resistance training. They want to gain some muscle mass. Um, extensive studies on safety in athletes, heavy training, non-athletes, uh, during normal fitness type of programs. None of those studies show any adverse effects. And I saw one question about, uh, you know, if you have low um, you know, uh, kidney function, should you stop? There actually are populations where they give it to dialysis patients because it helps manage homocysteine levels to a better degree. You look at the pathway for homocysteine production, which is a risk factor to heart disease, um, creatine can help prevent the increase. And so it's actually used in patients with renal disease. Mm -hmm. uh, Mediate. So there's never been any studies to show that. We are actually doing a huge database, looked at every study that has been done on creatine, looked at every placebo and every group with taking creatine dosage levels, looked at every reported side effect, and the report the side effects in clinical studies are just minuscule. And uh, we are going to present that at this conference coming up. And uh, It'd be pretty interesting to show that, you know, we did a study like this years ago and we found that people who were taking placebos had more problems taking the placebos than they, people who were taking creatine. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, one question, I tried to sort of um, uh, recap it a little bit. The supplementation recommendations, uh, is there a difference between male and female? Um, and then also, for, for example, age groups, you know, from young to old to masters, any uh, differentiation that we need to make or is it the recommendation that we have? And is that based on research primarily in one group or also in other groups? Well, I think initially we're mainly uh, males, but now there's been so many studies on men, women, elderly, clinical populations, children through seniors that we have pretty strong recommendations. Um, there's really no difference in the amount of creatine if you make it relative to body weight. So we re recommend to deal with larger versus smaller individuals is load with 0.3 grams per kg. Uh, you might make a case that if women have a little less muscle mass, they might be able to get away with 0.2 or 0.25 grams per kg. Uh, but 0.3, make sure you have plenty of creatine. And then to maintain, it's more like 0.03 or 0.1 grams per kg for larger athletes. So that has not changed between young, old, um, or uh, disease or male-female uh, type of populations. And in fact, some of the highest creatine intakes that have been studied are those kids with creatine synthetic deficiencies, and we're taking adult dosages equivalent to 70, 75 grams a day, which is like three times the loading dose. Mm -hmm. 0.8 grams per kg in a kid. Um, you know, that's a lot. I mean, you're only supposed to load with 0.3, so it's like two and a half times loading dose. And they've taken that for years to try to handle the. Mm -hmm. So um, we don't think there's any issues with that, and we just make it relative so that different sizes and genders are included. Yeah. So to follow up on this, can you have too much creatine in your body? Um, no, because once you've uh, saturated muscle, uh, and the tissue saturation, uh, whatever is not used is excreted into the urine. And what the other factor I would want to mention is that we're finding now that different types of tissues require different amounts and doses of creatine. For example, the brain takes more creatine uh, to load the brain over time than does muscle. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're giving 10 grams a day in elders to try to affect the brain concentrations of creatine to a greater degree. And some of the clinical populations like in Parkinson's and others that have been studied have gone 20, 25, 30 grams a day for five years to try to get really more effect on brain and nerve conduction and, and processes. So we think we'll find out is, you know, we based a lot of our studies on muscle, which is mm -hmm. you know, exercise, but we now know that certain tissues may need a little bit more. And the other thing I didn't mention too much is that 
in the brain, GAA, monocytic acid, the precursor to creatine, seems to be absorbed through the blood-brain uh, barrier to an easier degree than creatine. And therefore, we're actually doing studies combining GAA, like one gram GAA, with four or five grams of creatine monohydrate to try to optimize brain and muscle creatine content in older individuals. And so we'll, I think we're going to find there are ways to be able to improve this a little bit, but you can't just say muscle is everything because muscle absorbs creatine fairly easily. Mm -hmm. So, so just to follow up on this, you were saying, you know, if the muscle is saturated there, it will be excreted with, uh, with the kidneys. Is that also the moment that if you take a high dose that potentially there's more available for the brain to, to, to take up? Yes, exactly. So we think that your brain effects occur Absorption is more important after you've loaded the muscle because as it goes by, the muscle doesn't need it. So more is available to higher concentration get in the brain. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And so that's another reason why, you know, we did our initial studies. We didn't realize create them, maximize the muscle and all, you know, the loading. We gave 15, 20, 25 grants per day for up to three months in athletes. And if you look back at some of the studies, some of the best gains in muscle and strength and power were in these athletes taking very high doses for a long time. We think that you're going to have to do some of that with older populations uh, that may benefit in these other tissues like the brain, that if you took 10, 20 grams a day, they may even get better benefits. So there's more than the muscle. And so that's why a lot of the research is looking at the clinical applications and disease states, and maybe there's more needed. And if you already filled the muscle up, it's then available for all these other tissues uh, that uh, can use it. Awesome. Okay, so we are currently at the hour mark. Um, if you are currently tuning in and you sent in a question that hasn't been answered, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, obviously, you can directly email uh, Professor Kreider, if you have a question that really need, needs an answer. Um, if you tune in in the recording, that's the same case, obviously. Um, thank you, Professor Kreider, for this great overview and the, you know, the hit by hit by hit answers. Um, uh, I think this was a, an awesome job that you did today. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, looking forward to the next one. Uh, next week, we will have our next guest. Um, hope to see you then. Thank you, Brad.